This morning it's apple cider in my cup. Don't worry, I'll be making a cocktail after this build. Today's video is brought to you by NordPass. Are you tired of trying to remember all your username and password combinations? Have you run out of room on your monitor for more sticky notes? NordPass's user-friendly desktop and mobile applications allow you to easily access all of your passwords on any device. And with their zero-knowledge architecture, your data is encrypted on your own device before it ever reaches their servers. Visit nordpass.com slash craft today, and you can take 50% off a two-year premium subscription, plus get an extra month on the house. That's nordpass.com slash craft. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. The parts off to my right are what I get when I agree to review some new obscure motherboard that someone thought would be right up my alley. And even though they're right, it still creates a whole lot more work for me. So let's just dive right into this. Inside the box is the usual affair of accessories we get with motherboards like this. That is one IO shield and a SATA cable. However, the really funny thing about this particular board is they figured that because there are two CPUs on this motherboard that I needed two SATA cables. How thoughtful. So this motherboard is what's known as the X79 Lite from Ant Country. And I guess Ant Country is right there. Uh, it's a very, very interesting design motherboard as it is a dual socket motherboard in essentially a micro ATX extended form factor. Now, as much as I do love reviewing these obscure remanufactured Chinese boards, I really felt like I had taken the platform as far as I could go creatively. And I was really not sure that I wanted to do another build featuring an X79. However, that is until a viewer reached out with a very generous donation of a pair of Xeon 2687W V2 CPUs. These are literally the fastest single-threaded Xeons ever available for the X79 platform. Now these CPUs are only eight cores and 16 threads each, so they are definitely not the most dense CPUs you can get for the platform. However, these are Ivy Bridge chips with a 3.4 gigahertz base clock and a four gigahertz max turbo, making them uh, pretty darn speedy for most single threaded tasks. And of course, we're gonna do the turbo unlock mod to this motherboard to see if we can get these running at four gigahertz all the time. So what all is going into this build? Well, we've got our two CPUs right here. And to go along with that, we've got 64 gigabytes of DDR3 registered ECC memory running at 1866. So again, some of the fastest memory that you can get on this platform. Now this system is going to be a video editing workstation and we're gonna to need to do some HDMI capture on it as well. So I'm going to include an Avermedia Live Gamer HD2 capture card. This will capture HDMI at 1080p 60 frames per second and should fit the bill nicely. For cooling, Arctic was kind enough to send over a pair of their Freezer 34 Esports Duo Tower CPU coolers. These are dual fan 120 millimeter towers, and they should be a more than adequate match for these 135 watt CPUs. Plus, they're gonna look pretty flippin' sweet inside of our case. Speaking of the case, I think it's time to address the uh, elephant in the room, and that is the Thermaltake AHT200. This is a micro ATX open chassis that Thermaltake introduced at CES 2020. And love or hate the aesthetic, you can't argue that it is definitely unique. And as much as I'd love to use a current generation card, the sad fact is they're just not available. So we're reaching back to the previous generation in the ROG Strix RX 5700. This is an eight gigabyte card and should be a fantastic performer inside the system. For our primary storage, I've got a one terabyte Gen 3x4 NVMe drive from Silicon Power. These drives are only around $100 on Amazon and are a fantastic value, giving you up to about 3,500 megabytes per second read and write speeds. And finally, for the power supply, and since power supplies are also in short supply right now, I went with an old standby in the EVGA 850GQ. This is an 850 watt gold rated power supply with semi-modular cables and was the only power supply that I had on hand that had two 8-pin EPS connectors, as that's required by this motherboard. So it won by default. I've also got a couple other odds and ends that I'm gonna be throwing in here, but I think that's enough for the introductions. What do you say we get this thing rolling?
And we are back. Uh, I cannot tell you, number one, how thrilled I am to be done with this build. Not because it was insanely difficult, but because it was so gosh darn time consuming to build in this case. The AHT200 has some, number one, fantastic build quality to it. Not a single piece on this case wants to bend or creak or shift or flex. Everything is put together incredibly well. However, even though this is an open chassis, it's still not the easiest thing to work on. And despite its appearances, there are some pretty tight quarters inside of here, especially when you can't bend your left wrist at the moment. Relax, it's just tendonitis. It flares up every once in a while. I think it'd be remiss if we got much further into this video without talking about the looks of this system. And not to toot my own horn, but I think I might have outdone myself this time. Going into this build, I had some major question marks about fitment, mainly around those Arctic Freezer 34 Duo coolers. I knew that the max cooler height inside of this chassis was 150 millimeters, but that's measured from the standard CPU position, not from the CPU position of this particular board, which is further forward in the chassis. Let alone the height clearance concerns, I was also worried about the space between the processors. But as it turns out, they actually do fit on a dual processor board, although they are touching in the middle. And the frontmost fan might just be barely grazing the case right up here. So yes, they fit, although it's about as close as you can be without breaking out the Dremel. Moving on down the system, we come to our ROG Strix RX5700. And as you can see, that also fits inside this chassis, although it was very, very close, especially back towards the PCI Express bracket there was a little bit of limbo involved in getting it into this case. So in the end, I am pretty relieved that I managed to get everything into this case that I intended to. So why did I say at the beginning of this video that I was very happy this build was done? Well, it took me a full day and a half to get the system into the state that you see it in now. And why did this take me so long to build? Cable management. Because this is an open chassis and every single side of this has tempered glass looking straight into it, Cable management is of the utmost importance if you want this system looking good. And I will say, it turned out looking mighty fine if I do say so myself. But getting there was an absolute nightmare. Let's start back at the very beginning when I went to install the motherboard into the AHT200. The motherboard has now been in and out of the system probably six or seven times because I kept finding cables that I needed to route underneath the motherboard to keep them hidden. As I started building this case, I realized just how important cable management was, and I really wanted to be able to do this build justice. And again, I think I did pretty well. But it was so meticulous and so precise, and there's not a lot of room for cable management inside this case. Again, because every single angle of it is exposed, I ended up having to run all of the cables probably three or four different ways before I found a system that worked. Now, Thermaltake, to their credit, did think about cable management when they were designing this case. In fact, there's a pretty wide channel on the back of the motherboard tray specifically for running cables with some handy Velcro zip ties that are built right in. And I didn't exactly help matters when I chose one of the weirdest motherboard designs out there, which I don't even think has a standard. So I'm just going to call it extended micro ATX. Now this motherboard is technically a three slot design with two X16 slots and then one section for an NVMe drive, which means it only comes down to the third expansion bay. However, it is just as wide as an extended ATX motherboard. As such, I wound up covering pretty much all of the pass-through fittings on the back of the motherboard tray where the cables would normally pass through, like your 24 pin ATX or the graphics card leads. As there's not a lot of room for cable management in the system, I really wanted to minimize the number of cables I needed to use. I ended up going again with the 850GQ from EVGA, which is a partially modular power supply. I only needed to run two EPS connectors for the motherboard right here on top, and then the single lead for the 8-pin graphics card. Now you might notice I do have some RGB effects going in here, and there's actually an RGB controller that is hot glued to the back of the chassis here so we can make adjustments. But that is normally a SATA powered device. How did I do that without plugging in a SATA lead to my power supply? A SATA power connector delivers five volts. Well, five volts is five volts, and I'm not exactly a real high current over here as I'm not running that many LEDs. So I wound up tapping off a USB 2.0 header on the motherboard, which delivers, you guessed it, five volts. 
The next problem to solve was the RGB controller only has a single cable coming out of it and usually relies on a hub to plug all of your RGB devices into. But I didn't want the hub taking up any more room inside the chassis, so I ended up splicing a second RGB lead out of that controller so both fans could plug in. What I wound up with was a very clean look on the backside of the motherboard tray with the ability to change RGB effects, all for the added cost of one single cable. And speaking of the fans themselves, you'll notice I didn't mention what fans I was going to go with in the introduction of this video. And that's really because I didn't know what fans I was going to go with when I started this build. Going shopping on my parts shelf, I wound up choosing these. These are the MF120 fans from Deepcool. At the time that I reviewed them about two years ago, I wasn't really a big proponent of using these. They're a really odd design as they are completely frameless and they don't provide a lot of static pressure because of that. They're mainly used for airflow. However, the frames that are on them are made of aluminum, which means you can't mount them into most traditional cases with your standard threaded case screw. Instead, you have to use these weird rubber standoffs that quite honestly did not work at all. But as soon as I saw them on the shelf, I knew they would be absolutely perfect for this build. And some 632 nuts later, and they bolted right into this case. And quite honestly, I am so happy with the way they turned out. Moving into the top section of this case, where I've got a pair of Corsair ML140s. Now, the AHT200 was an Apache helicopter-inspired design, so I figured I might as well put in a set of fans that might be able to actually lift this thing off the ground. Between those and the literal jet turbine that I installed from Arctic, I'm expecting some pretty good results as far as temperatures go inside the system. Moving into the heart of the system with that Ant Country motherboard, running a pair of Xeon E5 2687W V2 processors. I'm not necessarily in love with this motherboard. Now, it comes with the same quirks and follies and shortcomings that all of the remanufactured X79s do, but this one has a couple of additional quirks that I'm not overly fond of. First off, while there are a pair of USB 3.0 ports on the back of this motherboard, that's it for USB 3.0 connectivity. There's no header elsewhere on the board, which means you are limited to those two ports unless you end up getting a USB hub. Now the board kinda tries to make up for that shortcoming with some extra USB 2.0 connectivity. There are six points on the rear and an additional three headers on the motherboard. But that also means that the USB 3.0 on the front of the chassis, I had to buy an adapter to plug it into a USB 2.0 header and I'm going to be limited to 2.0 speeds. And that's to say nothing for the Type-C port right next to it. Being as there's no 3.0 connectivity on the inside of this board, that means that port pretty much doesn't exist for me. You might have also noticed there's only four DIMM slots on this motherboard, or two per CPU. That means we're going to be limited to dual channel memory on each of these CPUs, where we would normally have quad channel. And while the BIOS on this system is overall about what I expected and functional, I also could not find a way to modify this BIOS to add the all-core turbo hack, which means we're going to be stuck at 3.6 GHz instead of boosting all the way up to 4.0. That to me is probably the biggest disappointment that I have, as these chips at 3.6 GHz are only drawing 110 watts, meaning that bumping up to 4.0 GHz was number one, absolutely achievable, and number two would require no additional modifications to get past the TDP limit on these chips. So hardware aside, how does the system actually perform? Honestly, I was absolutely blown away by this system not only from the raw performance, but also the cooling performance with these two Xeon chips. Under a 10 minute sustained Cinebench R23 stress test, CPU number one in the front of this chassis peaked at just 55 degrees Celsius, and CPU two, getting the hot air exhaust, peaked at just 61. I will say I did have some major concerns about those Freezer 34 coolers when I pulled them out of the box. Even though they say they are compatible with LGA 2011 and 2066 sockets, the contact surface on it is very narrow. In fact, there's a lot of the heat spreader on top of those Xeons that is still just exposed to open air. That being said, these temperature results quite literally broke my mind for a short time, as I really didn't believe them. But the top of the case is cool to the touch, and the fans never ramp up beyond 1000 RPM when doing that Cinebench stress test pretty insane results. As far as raw performance goes, inside of Cinebench R15, we saw a single threaded score of 136, putting it just below an i7-3770 non-overclocked. 
not too shabby as far as performance. In multi-threaded performance though, it scored a 2490, putting it in a virtual tie with the Xeon E5 2670 V2 dual CPU system, which by the way, has an extra four cores and eight threads to it. So without getting into any crazy BIOS hacks or experimentation, which by the way, if you know how to unlock turbo on the system, let me know, I'm still interested in doing it. This actually holds up with the best of the Ivy Bridge systems and should be seen as the top example of a system from that generation. So the system does have looks to kill and performance to match, but like I said, was a little bit of a headache to actually get into this state with a lot of custom cables and even a little bit of soldering involved to make it come out this clean. But in the end, I am more than happy with the results. But what do you guys think? Was it worth it for the $110 motherboard and about $160 per processor? Or would you rather have gone another route? Let me know down in the comments below. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with my daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon or Float Plane. Links are also down in the video description. As a bonus, you'll get exclusive access to my Discord server, where you can chat with myself and the other hosts from Talking Heads. Thank you all for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. So good. As you may be aware, we are right in the middle of Mixology March, and today I'm going to be making, again, one of my favorite cocktails in the Amaretto Sour. Now this is a cocktail that does bring out some mixed opinions. Some people really like it, other people get a little bit sketched out because of the ingredients. No, it's not absinthe or some really obscure liquors like that. No, it's a uh, raw egg. More specifically, we're going to be using the egg white, not the yolk, but still, some people get a little sketched out by that. If you are sketched out by that, you're more than welcome to leave the egg white out. You're just not going to end up with that creamy white meringue-like head on top. The other ingredients are a little bit more common. We've got a lemon, we've got some amaretto, in this case I'm using Di Sirono. We need a rye or a bourbon, in this case I'm using a Crater Lake Reserve rye whiskey, it's a 96 proof. I will say slightly overproof whiskeys do add a little bit more character to this drink. We need some simple syrup, and I have just enough left, I think, to uh, make this cocktail, and some Angostura bitters. So start out by adding your egg white to the mixer. Now the reason we start out with the egg white and not any of the other liquors is in case we screw up. Because if you crack the yolk and drop it in there, I'd rather not waste, you know, two and a half ounces worth of liquor when I'd rather just waste one egg. Next up, we'll need three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup. We'll need three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice. If you have a pretty good lemon, you can usually get that out of a half of one. I don't know if we're gonna quite get that lucky here though. Oh, we're gonna get really close. Awesome. Just enough. So three quarter ounce lemon juice. You need one full ounce of whiskey. And an ounce and a half of amaretto. Now we're gonna shake everything up without ice. This is called a dry shake. And you really wanna beat the living heck out of that egg so you can get it nice, whoa. <laughs> we just about had a really big problem. Try that again. Now you want to shake the living crap out of that egg so you get it nice and frothy. Break that open. Now we're going to add our ice. One big rock for our glass. One half size rock for the mixer and then some crushed ice. There we go. And then shake it again. Then we're gonna strain it right into our rocks glass. And to finish this off, we're gonna do two dashes of Angostura bitters right on top of the mix right there. And then give that a little bit of a swirl. And you have an Amaretto Sour. And before you drink this one, it's good to let it rest for just a couple of minutes. Let all of that egg kinda rise its way to the top. You end up with a thicker and much finer head on top of it. Seriously, this is a boozy lemon meringue pie in a glass. How can you possibly go wrong with that?